Hello. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. My name is Mariano Naya. I'm a software engineer at Skyscanner. And today I'll talk about asynchronous programming and how it works uh, in modern Python. Basically, the idea of, of this talk is to actually revisit the main milestones that have been happening in versions of Python that arrived to um, the current state of the art in, in our programming language. Basically, the idea I've been digging through some old peps in order to understand what had been the main cornerstones uh, with the idea of not just exploring the API, because probably you already know that or you, you know how to use the functions, but maybe you're interested in knowing what's behind it or how things work or you're curious about uh, what's internally for it. So this is a rather long journey in terms of, of time because it starts with something that came up a, a very long time ago with generators in the year 2001 in a very old version of Python, 2.2. And the idea was back in the day to support a more efficient way of computation. Like, for instance, they were created with the idea of lazy iteration in mind. So let's say you have to process a large uh, bunch of objects, let's say like a million numbers or a trillion numbers. And one way of doing so, you say, I can put everything into a list and then process the list. And that would work, but it will take a lot of, of memory. So, or the same goes for any object. So the idea was to, okay, let's provide a mechanism in Python to be able to generate only the object that I need at a given point in time and no more than that and save a lot of memory. So the, the, the point of this is that there were, uh, the idea is, okay, we save memory and we support like the, the iteration pattern. And at a point in time, the generator is going to give us the value we need for, for that particular moment and it's going to suspend there. And it's going to be there until we call it again with the next value that we need. So a new keyword was introduced, the GL. And this works like with two very simple concepts. You have any function, but if that function happens to have a GL uh, statement in any part of its body, it's going to be uh, a generator function, which means that when you call it, whatever is on the body of the function is not going to run. Instead, it's, it's going to give you a generator object. So they work like a factory. When you call it, you received an, a generator that was just constructed. And then you start working with that object, uh, advancing the element one at a time. At, at next point, uh, you get the element, the generator is going to suspend there. It's going to be like frozen, waiting to be called again uh, with the next value. And there is nothing else to produce because it got exhausted. And in that case, a stop iteration exception is raised, uh, which is the mechanism to signal that that iteration is over. So now let's say that time after we want to support coroutines in Python. And I'm not giving like a, an academic or like a formal definition of coroutines, but just for the purpose of this talk, we are going to have a more pragmatic understanding of coroutines. It will be something like uh, you are able to suspend at any point in time, but you also want to be able to resume at a later point in the program to be able to continue the, the execution with uh, different values. So if we were to implement this in Python, like, and we start to think, okay, how, how can we have this working? Um, do we have to, um, let's say, start from, from scratch and implement it, everything on top, or is, is there something that we can already take advantage of? And the reason why I started with, with generators is, is because, okay, they have something that we can use for advantage, which is the, the point of suspension. Remember that a generator is suspended at a point in time, so the interpreter is, is frozen in, in a part of the code, and then it can be resumed later on. So this, uh, this pep came along. It says coroutine by enhanced generators because, okay, there is something that we can take advantage of. So it's, it's not that we have to do everything again. So let's recap how far can we go with, with generators, with simple can, can we suspend? Yes, actually that, that was the whole point of using them in the first place. But can we pass some data to the generator while it's suspended? I mean, in, in its simple form, like in, the, in a very basic form? No, that, that's not possible. Uh, what about exceptions? Can, can we send an exception to, to a generator once it's suspended to signal that something has going on uh, in the program? No, that was not possible. So that's why the enhanced part came along and the interface of generators needed to be extended. So more methods were added uh, to fulfill this purpose. For instance, the same method with and the throw through handled exceptions and close 
to do some cleanup in the, in the coroutine or the generator. But technically, that's just a particular case of throw because it just handles an exception, uh, which is generator exit. But the most important is, is send because it's what changes the, the semantics a little bit. So now, let's stop for a second in this concept because, okay, we have generators and we start to think in coroutines because we can create something that we are able to suspend and interact with at a point in time in the program. So syntactically, there are differences. There hasn't been any changes in, in coroutines. They, they still use the yield keyword as, they, as the old generators did uh, in the very beginning. But semantically, they are different. Because, and I will come up with this later in a few slides, but just keep in mind that even though they're, they're written the same and they're even technically the same thing, conceptually they're, they're meant with completely different purposes. Uh, and this will also be an important uh, step later. But for now, let's say how we can interact with coroutines, at least in a very basic form, because we're still in, in a very old version of Python. This is still to, uh, 2005, Python 2.5. And now, GIL not only produces values to, to the caller, but it also can get some value as a result. So uh, now, GIL, for example, result is what the caller is going to get when it calls the, the generator or coroutine. And res value, in this case, the variable value, is going to be whatever was passed from the outside to the coroutine. It's going to be captured. So I prepared a small example just to illustrate this. Um, let's say how a coroutine that only iterates and it's counting some steps and it's printing whatever got received. So I want to create that coroutine and start sending values just to see how this now GIL works in, in both ways. So the first thing I'll do is I'll create the, the coroutine. Let's pause for a second. Wait. So uh, once I create it, remember, it gives me a, a generator object because it's like a factory. And then I call next the first time, this is an important detail because if I don't call next, I'm not able to send anything to it uh, or I will get a type error. This is because the next, remember that it moves the execution of the coroutine or generator up, up to the next GIL statement, so it needs to pause there so I can send the first uh, element. Okay, so now the program advances up to that point where it's uh, waiting for something and look at that line, the, the one is like, you can, you, can th you can think like that line is split in like in two ways and only half that statement uh, run, the part that gave me the value zero because it yielded the first step which it started at zero point. So now I can start interacting with the generator and let's say that I will send, I don't know, 100. And the second part of that statement, the one that works inwards, let's say, towards uh, from the outside to the generator is going to run now receive is going to have the value 100 because it's Hollis, and then the rest of the program is going to run. So it's going to increment the step, it's going to print whatever I just sent, which is the value 100. It's going to circle back to the beginning of the loop with the last, uh, to the true statement, and then it's going to find the next yield when it's going to pause again and suspend there until I do something about it. And it yielded the, re uh, the step, now one, and that becomes the result of send. Same. So it's, it's similar to next. Actually, now next is a particular case, uh, case of send. So calling next on a generator is like sending none. But uh, we, we had the idea that it's backwards compatible, and now we, we have the semantics. And anyway, if this is a deliberate, like, simple example just to illustrate how it works, it marks the beginning of coroutines, because now that we can suspend and interact with the coroutine, we can do some asynchronous uh, programming. We can suspend and do some non-blocking I.O. operation while signaling the program that, that, that it's waiting and there is something else that can be run. So, okay, and now if I send uh, or if, if I throw an exception, you can, of course, get whatever is happening. The exception uh, is going to be thrown at the point where the coroutine is suspended. And in this case, it's going to fail because it's not handled, but you can add as part of your logic to handle the, the exception, of course. So now, okay, this, this is great, but let's see if we can, do, we can do better because this is not entirely convenient. And what if we want to have larger programs or we want to refactor coroutines? So this pep came along, 380, which Actually, now we're in Python 3, so we're getting closer to the current API. I say it's like syntax for delegating to a sub-generator. And this is actually quite 
important because it marks like two important uh, improvements. First, now generators can return values, which before it wasn't possible. You couldn't have a return statement inside a generator because it will be a syntax error. And now the geo from syntax was introduced, which will explain the semantics and how both things are related. One has to do with the other. So let's say I have another simple generator or coroutine that only produces two values, and I call it the first time. I got one, of course. Then second time, I got the value two. And then there's nothing else to produce. And remember that stop iteration was the exception that was signaling that that generator was exhausted, that there was nothing else to produce. OK, now the same happens, but the return value comes in the exception, because exceptions are just Python objects, after all, and we can set any attributes to objects because they're dynamically added. So the return value will come in the value attribute of the stop iteration exception, and that way, whoever is calling that coroutine can know what, not only that it finished and it completed, but with, with which value it completed. So now we can say, like, Jill from, like, in a very most simple form, like, whenever you have an iterable, and you you Jill from that iterable, and then you, you can do a for loop, and then yield every element of the iterable, and that would work. But that is not the actual reason why this was introduced in Python. There was actually much, much better use of that. And it has to do with the true previous points. Like, first, this, this syntax is going to uh, allow you to chain coroutines. Like, so remember the example I, I just gave when you send values or you throw exceptions to coroutines, where well, you can do it that with multiple levels. So let's say, like, I have a coroutine that calls another one, that calls another one. Uh, the, the mechanism works the same. And now it's important to know why uh, coroutines can return values, because I can capture the return value with this syntax into a variable. And even if it doesn't look like too big deal, it's actually quite interesting, because if you look at the syntax, it kind of resembles like a, like a thread. Like you, you have something running there. It's not a thread, of course. Technically, it's not a thread. But the point is, you have something there running that you don't know which order it's going to run. You don't know how it's going to run. At some point, it's going to suspend and continue. And some point in the program, it's going to stop there, and it's going to give me a final value. And I can have that in multiple, multiple levels. So this starts to improve things quite a lot. And this marks something that we are probably more f familiar with, with, which is um, we can have multiple of, of these, drill them from different coroutines and do like different operations, like for instance, reading from a database or uh, doing an HTTP request, something that is not blocking, and while the actual IO, while the actual operation in the database is going to take, is, is taking place, the, the program or some prom part of the program can uh, know that and, okay, say this part of the code is suspended, I can run something else in the meantime and, um, schedule the order. So let's see this with an example. Let's say that now I have a generator that it, I call general that calls another generator inside of that. So it yields from that generator. And again, it's a simple example just to illustrate the, the mechanism, but uh, it works all, all the same with multiple levels. I mean, this works at all levels. So it just prints out the, a loop similar to the first example, and when f one part completes, it will continue with the next one. So, okay, like I create my coroutine, like at the beginning, and I call next to it because I want to start sending values. And of course, I get the first one, but then I, I send something, and remember that I'm sending that to the, to the first coroutine, to the general, not to uh, one of the internals. And if you see the print message, you'll see that what it was printed was the first one. The first one got that, that string. So what happens is I send something to general, general passes it to the internal coroutine, it did the processing, it printed the value, it yielded something that went back to the general and that became the result of the, of the send statement. So now we can have a more uh, sophisticated code, we can like refactor uh, and have smaller coroutines with more fine, uh, fine grained uh, responsibility. And of course, if, if I keep iterating that, this will, keep, uh, will continue until the first one uh, stops, and then the second one will take place. And it all works like if it were just one coroutine, I would just put all the code in, in, a, 
in a, in, a, in a single function. So this is actually quite convenient because actually this pep has an example of the code you would have to write if you didn't have this functionality uh, built in in Python. So it's actually saves, saving a lot of code and, it, and a lot of trouble as well because there are a lot of exceptions that you have to handle that stop iteration and with different conditions, etc. So just to uh, recap, this syntax allows us to create even more powerful core routines and chain many iterables all together. Um, well, structuring our code in a more convenient way. And with this, we can start thinking about like event loops and some objects that are going to handle uh, core routines. But that, that is not all because there, there are still more things to do. I mean, even if this is a great improvement, it's not everything. Like, remember, that I mentioned in the in the beginning that there was a when we first start to think about coroutines, uh, we wanted to have like we we build it in top of generators. We said like, okay, syntactically they're the same. They use GL, the GL statement or GL from. So and actually technically a coroutine is a kind of generator, but semantically they're different. So uh, generators were created with the idea of iteration in mind and supporting the iteration pattern. While coroutines were created with the idea of asynchronous programming in mind or suspending some part of, of the code or non-preemptive computation. So those are two different um, use cases or completely different computing scenarios that fall into the same technical detail, which is that down the line in Python there is a generator running there. So and also the GIL from syntax works with any iterables. Generators are iterables but they are also, other kind of iterables that are not generators are not coroutines, for instance, strings or list. So, and you can do GIL from a generator or a coroutine, and that will make sense, but syntactically nothing prevents you or stops you from writing like something like GIL from a string, uh, and, or a, when you were expecting a coroutine in that place. And that would fail, and since Python is dynamically typed, you probably won't notice the error until late in the program. So a more time came uh, past, and this was okay. We need to address these limitations, and in more and more version of Python's, uh, again the syntax changed. Notice that since the very beginning, in 2001, when the GIL was introduced, there were no new keywords in Python, and now uh, we are in the, the version of Python 5 and the year 2015 or 16, and new syntax is being introduced. So all that long time, there was pretty much no changes syntactically, even though there were no constructions. And the idea is, with this PEP, uh, 492, we can create coroutines with its own syntax. So when you, instead of putting def, you put async def, you're creating a native coroutines. Before, it's not just a kind of generator that has a flag in the virtual machine. Now, they're in the PEP, they're called native coroutines. And instead of chill from, you would use await, and this addresses the semantic or the problems that we had in the previous um, examples. For instance, now you, you, it's harder to make mistakes, which is a good thing. Remember that before you, there was nothing preventing you from you doing GIL from a string when you were expecting uh, a coroutine, but now you cannot do a wait string accidentally because it will fail. Python will, will throw um, a type error saying, okay, a wait only works with coroutines or iterable or awaitable objects, which are objects that implement the magic method for await. So with, with this syntax, now things start to look more um, like in, in the last version of Python 3.7 or even in the future version of Python. And now we can take a look okay, at what, what AsyncIO is, is actually doing. Because, okay, now we, we create our coroutines with a new syntax, and I think IO is just an event loop, which is an object, is the one that comes in the, in the standard library, but you can use any other event loop. Um, whatever is going to happen is like, okay, we define our coroutines, and typically our coroutines do delegate to some other third party libraries, like for instance, let's say I use async PC to connect to the database, and do a wait or a select or, or a query. And what happens is our the event loop is going to call a coroutine at some point in time. It's going to run the call. Our core is going to delegate to the third party library, which down the line is going to implement uh, the IO 
At that point, when we call await, it's going to return something to the event loop. So that way, it signals the event loop, and it's the way the event loop knows that that coroutine is uh, suspended, it's waiting for the I.O. operation to complete. So another one will take place and will run, and the same will happen again and again and again. And at, some, at, at all points, the coroutine is just going to be updating the status of the, of the uh, sorry, the event loop is going to be updating the status of the coroutine. So you're going to call send or throw respect, uh, respectively, as it happens with the exceptions. In order, so our coroutine can know, okay, I have to act with this value, or I have to respond to this exception, etc. So down the line, there's nothing like fundamentally new or different that, it's, that is going on in Python. Um, the idea is like, okay, technically coroutines are still some type of um, generators, which this is for historical and, and technical reasons. Remember that semantically they are different. And things that look to be like completely different or completely new or, or different stuff are actually uh, more simple constructions that we have been using in Python for quite a long time. Um, it dates for a very old um, time. Remember that, for, ex for instance, like every time we call away, it will, it will call something that down the line it will end up at a GIL statement, just as a way of signaling that that has to suspend. So this is probably the way I, will, I wanted to show the, the, or explain the way asynchronous programming works, because it's not like um, perhaps under, understanding what's behind or demystifying what's, what's actually Python doing every time we, we program asynchronously in, in our program. Um, that's pretty much it. I think you enjoy, I, I really hope you enjoy the talk and the rest of the conference as well. Thank you very much for listening. We have three minutes for questions, if you have any.